Okay, so I'm just going to go through a fairly simple example now of a vector field. So, of course, we'll begin with the manifold. I'm going to use R2 for simplicity. Now, we've already seen that we can think about the points of R2 as lying on this kind of Cartesian plane, where the points in R2 are just d tuples of real numbers. And then we usually like to use the trivial chart, which is just essentially assigning each point each point, so we just talk about the x and y coordinates of a point now. So that's a perfectly valid chart for R2, but you'll recall just as Cartesian coordinates are completely valid, we could talk about polar coordinates instead. So rather than assigning to each point in the manifold its x and y coordinate, we instead assign it R and theta coordinate. So these are the two, or one of the many possible charts on R2 x and y, r and theta, and now the x, y chart coordinate lines are just the straight and horizontal lines, whereas the r and theta, we have our radial lines, and then the circles of constant radius. So we would expect now any kind of vector field that we define is going to have a very different representation in these two coordinate systems. So now let's see this explicitly. I'm going to first just define for you the vector field, which is going to be given by this expression. So this is our vector field now, not just a single vector at a point. What does it consist of? Well, it's just simply the d by d theta basis vector. If you like, the theta component is just one. So this is just the vector which is going to derive you in the theta direction, or intuitively this is just going to produce the tangent to the theta direction. So if we remember now we have our circles of constant radii, theta is the only variable that changes and theta increases in the sort of counterclockwise fashion. So this vector field d by d theta produces the tangent vector in the direction of increasing theta. So it's just this kind of circularly spiraling counterclockwise vector field. And now remember I've only drawn a few of the vectors in the vector field. There is going to be one of these vectors at every single point in the manifold. And because the component is just one, all the vectors are normalized to have unit length. I could have just written any kind of constant here, or even something more complicated like a function over the radius. But for now I'm just going to consider this simple d by d theta. Okay, so the expression for the vector field in the theta chart is very simple, it's just the d by d theta basis vector. Now what I've drawn here is actually the image of this vector field on the manifold itself, because remember the manifold is R2, I've simply drawn the manifold and drawn one of the charts, the x and y chart, on the same figure. So our d by d theta vector field looks like this on the manifold, but now I want to show you how it looks in something slightly different. If you'll recall, we're mapping the manifold into a chart. So what I've drawn on this figure is the manifold. I've overlaid on this figure the xy chart, which if you'll remember is just the same thing as the manifold. But now let's consider what the points of this manifold look like in a different chart, r and theta. So already this is looking different, we only have positive r and theta values. So let's just remember a few things. Our lines of constant radius, which I've drawn in orange, they're simply just the vertical lines at constant radius varying theta. And then for example, a line of constant theta, which I've drawn, is just going to be like this. So now, what's the point in me showing you this? Well, I'm trying to explain to you how the vector field looks different in different coordinate systems. So here we can see it's kind of spiraling counterclockwise. Now if I redraw the vector in its chart, remember this is the vector field on the manifold, 
what's the vector field doing? Well, it's just pointing in the theta direction. So all our arrows are just going to be pointing straight up like this. And they'll be everywhere in the plane. So this looks very different to this vector field. On R2, it's counterclockwise spiraling, but in the R theta chart, it's just pointing straight up. So this is really just to illustrate how the components of a vector don't really mean much unless you're talking about their components with respect to what coordinate system. Okay, so that's easy enough to visualize for this very simple vector field. How would we go about calculating something like this in practice? Well, essentially what we're trying to do here is change coordinates so we can use the results of the previous video. What we're trying to do is find an expression for this V vector field, which is given to us in the R theta chart. We want to transition to the X, Y chart to find the new expression for the vector field. So if you'll remember how we would go about doing this, we want to use the powerful expression that we derived, that the vector can be realized as a kind of independent quantity from coordinates in this sort of shorthand notation here. And this allows us to essentially express the vector in any basis. So if I just quickly write down that the vector in the x, y basis now is going to be the following expression where I'm essentially using now a shorthand where rather than writing a number on the index I'm just labeling the index by the variable. So this is the x component and this is d by dx. So this expression gives our vector in the x, y coordinates which of course has to be equal to the vector in the r theta coordinates. So the easiest way to reconcile these two expressions now is to use the chain rule. So we essentially need to write down an expression for this d by d theta basis vector in terms of the x and y basis vectors. So to do that, we need to remember a few things. We need to remember what our coordinates or how they're defined and their transition function. So the expression I'm writing now is how we go between the r and theta to the x and y coordinates. So now all we need to do is use the chain rule again to express d by d theta in terms of d by dx and d by dy. So you can see here that theta is mapping to both x and y, so when we use the chain rule we're going to have to have it for a multivariable function. So if I just write down the expression... Okay, hopefully you can see why this is correct, it's just using the chain rule. If it helps you to visualize, you could write in the arbitrary function here. Remember, this is the arbitrary function that the vector is eventually going to act on. So now that we've used the chain rule, that's all the work done. We just need to make a few identifications. So this d by dx is our basis vector here, and similarly for y. So we can identify the component vx is dx by d theta, and similarly vy is dy by d theta. And now I simply just need to take the derivative of these two expressions and I'll find... Okay, so that was just taking the derivative of x with respect to theta and substituting here. And now I realize that r sine theta is y, r cos theta is x, and I get the final expression minus y dx. Okay, so what I've essentially derived now is the expression for the d by d theta vector field, this counterclockwise spiraling field, in the x, y coordinates. So maybe you've seen an expression like this before. If you've ever taken a quantum mechanics course, you'll recognize this as the angular momentum operator in the z direction, which is intuitively clear since we're talking about a counterclockwise spiraling vector field. Don't worry if this is too much for you. Now we can, whilst this expression appears a lot more complicated, we can easily think about what it's doing if we just consider some points of interest. So say, take the point x is 1, y is 0, this term goes away, and then we're just left with d by dy. So that's essentially a vector pointing in the positive y direction. Similarly, if we go up to here, y is 1, x is 0, 
we just have a vector pointing along negative d by dx. So we can see that everywhere in the plane we're going to be pointed along the d by d theta direction. So, okay, hopefully this fairly simple example has been illuminating for you in how we see and think about vector fields in different coordinate systems. I just now want to stress again that the picture I drew here is the manifold, so the, the vector field that we draw on the manifold is the vector field. It's just going to look different in whatever coordinate system we use. We're just kind of lucky in this case that the chart and the manifold are the same, so in this XY chart the vector field appears as it would in real life on the manifold, but of course in the R theta chart it looks nothing like the real world, it's just all pointing in the theta direction. So the point with this is that you need to be very careful about talking about vectors in terms of coordinates, because the vector in coordinates is a very different object to the actual vector on the manifold. We were just lucky here because the manifold and the chart are the same. The vector appears in the same way on the manifold as it does in the chart. So once we've got our vectors in the chart, we then saw how we can use what we previously discovered that charts should all agree and we should be able to transition freely between them. We then use that with the, um, the expression we derived previously for how the vector components transform and I showed you how you can just easily calculate this transformation using the chain rule. Because rather than talking about components transforming, all you need to do is just transform the basis vectors and then everything else follows from just the, the transformation law essentially. Bye bye maybe.